Hey, this is Dr. Cummings from Point Loma Nazarene University, and this is Microbiology of Infectious Diseases. This is part two of a three-part series introducing you to antibiotics and how antibiotics work. In the, the first video in this series, part one, uh, I introduced you to the Sanford Guide and some basic principles of antimicrobial chemotherapy. And now we're going to really focus in on the antibiotics, the antibacterials. Now, there's a real important principle here called spectrum of activity. In other words, what microbes is a particular drug useful against? So we're going to talk about narrow spectrum antibiotics that are useful against a limited number of bacteria. Broad spectrum antibiotics that are good against a lot, a long list you could think of it as, of bacteria. And then the trade-offs for each because they each have a time and place, a narrow spectrum antibiotic versus a broad spectrum antibiotic. And then I'm going to leave you with the idea of super infections, which is a possible, um, a possible complication from using broad spectrum antibiotics in particular. So <clears throat> what do we mean when we say antibiotic activity spectrum? Narrow spectrum antibiotics target a very limited number of species. Think of it as a short list. Right, a short list of bacteria that a particular drug would be effective against. And I'm going to show you some examples in just a minute. Whereas broad spectrum antibiotics are going to have a long list. Right, they have a broad range of species that they're going to be effective against. And so what I want you to think about is when you might want to use one versus another and what sort of um, <clears throat> negative characteristics are there to each. Like, What's the downside to using a narrow-spectrum drug? What's the downside to using a broad-spectrum drug? This figure here from, from your book gives you a little bit of a visual sense of the idea of, the, of a, an activity spectrum. So, for example, among the prokaryotes, uh, you take a, a drug like streptomycin that we don't use much anymore. But streptomycin is good against the mycobacteria, right? These guys cause tuberculosis, for example. And then it's good against gram-negative bacteria like E. coli, but it's not good against gram-positives. That would be things like uh, Staph aureus. It's not good against the chlamydias or rickettsias, which are really strange little, um, essentially gram-negatives genetically, but they don't have any peptidoglycan. They've got really weird, um, weird cell envelopes. And then they're not going to cross over at all into the eukaryotes or the viruses. And we talked about that in the last, uh, the last video. Uh, if we look at penicillin, natural penicillin is really only good against gram-positive bacteria. So we would call this a narrow-spectrum antibiotic. Compare that to the tetracycline drugs. These are gonna be broad-spectrum antibiotics because we can use them against pretty much all the prokaryotes except for the mycobacteria. Another narrow-spectrum drug would be isoniazid that's only good against the mycobacteria. You wouldn't use it for any other uh, microbes, any other infections of any kind. And then you notice that we've got our bacteria here, our various eukaryotes here, and our viruses down here. And you notice that um, none of the drugs they're showing you cross over those broader boundaries from viruses to eukaryotes to prokaryotes. Every now and then we'll come across an antibacterial agent that might have a little bit of activity against, for example, a protozoan. Um, but for the most part, they don't cross over those boundaries at all. Let's think about the trade-offs, okay? Maybe even pause this video just for a minute and consider, okay, what's the benefit? What would be the primary advantage of a narrow-spectrum antibiotic? And what would be the trade-off to it? What's the negative or disadvantage to it? What about a broad-spectrum antibiotic like tetracycline? What would be an advantage to using that? But what could be a disadvantage to using that? Go ahead and hit pause, think through that for a minute, and then start the video again. Okay, I'm assuming you paused it, you thought this through. Let's start with our, our narrow spectrum antibiotics like penicillin. The real advantage to a narrow spectrum drug is that the damage is limited to the target cells. Remember we talked about selective toxicity in the last video. And these, these chemicals, by nature, have to be toxic. Um, the more selective they are, the less damage they do, both to the host, the patient, as well as to other bacteria that are providing um, some real important services to the patient. But what's the real disadvantage here? Maybe you picked this up already. It's useful against a limited number of species, which means you really have to know what you're up against. 
uh, in a time crunch and you didn't, let's say you've got a patient that comes in and they've got a, a sepsis, they've got a bloodborne pathogen, you may not have time to uh, send a sample to the lab and tell them, yeah, we'll get you started on some antibiotics in a couple days when we figure out what this is because we want to limit damage to target cells as much as possible. No, you may need a broad spectrum drug at that point because <clears throat> if you choose a narrow spectrum antibiotic and you're wrong about what the pathogen is, the infection is going to continue. You lose a couple days, you might also lose your patient. What about a broad spectrum drug? What are the advantages? Well, useful against numerous species, like in the situation I just gave you, where you really don't know what the pathogen is and uh, time is critical. You may use something like tetracycline as quickly as possible because it's going to hit gram negatives, gram positives. It's going to hit, um, what other groups did we say, the chlamydias and the rickettsias, right? All of these groups are going to be hit by tetracycline, but the disadvantage is that it's going to damage the normal microbiome, the bacteria that are living on and in your patient, and potentially there's going to be some toxicity to your patient as well because it's less selective in its toxicity. The narrow spectrum antibiotics are more selective in their toxicity, and the broad spectrum antibiotics are less selective in their toxicity. Hopefully this idea makes sense to you. It's really important. Now with an, a broad spectrum antibiotic, we said that one of the, the concerns is damaging the normal microbiome. Why do we care about the normal microbiome? Well, one of the things the normal microbiome does is protects your patient from what's called a super infection. A super infection is an infection on top of an original infection. You could think of it as a secondary infection, but it's an infection that results from our interventions typically, right? Either from the, the primary infection itself or from our interventions. So broad spectrum antibiotics like tetracyclines, um, clindamycin is a real common uh, guilty party here for causing super infections. They damage the normal microbiome and one of the main jobs of the normal microbiome is something called microbial antagonism. Microbial antagonism is where the presence of healthy bacteria in and on you um, helps to repel the random stray pathogens that find their way in, and it keeps those pathogens in check. If those, if the normal microbiome gets uh, gets depleted, then those pathogens that we run into regularly um, have a chance to, to overgrow. So we interrupt our microbial antagonism. This can lead to these super infections, which is overgrowth by what we call opportunistic pathogens. Pathogens that maybe can't cause disease under normal conditions because, you're, because of microbial antagonism, but when that competition is gone, they all of a sudden sort of awaken. So for example, a yeast infection. Candida albicans is the most common yeast that causes various yeast infections. And because it's a yeast, that means it's a fungus which also means that an antibiotic is not going to kill it. So if, let's say, someone's carrying uh, candida albicans in small numbers in the gut, uh, the, and they take something like oral clindamycin for a few weeks to knock down a, a MRSA infection, the clindamycin might kill the MRSA infection, but it's also going to wipe out, deplete the microbes in the gut. It's going to minimize the antagonism that's been keeping the yeast in check, and now the yeast can bloom, so to speak, and overgrow and heavily colonize the lining and cause a, an intestinal yeast infection that then is going to be really difficult to get rid of. So hopefully that idea makes sense. Candida albicans is a common one. Another one that you've heard of is called C. diff, Clostridium difficile. And because C. diff forms spores, the spores are impervious to antibiotics. And so again, uh, a long, heavy course of antibiotics like clindamycin, or especially if it's an oral antibiotic, is going to wipe out and deplete the intestinal flora. The spores could care less because they're asleep anyway. And then they just wake up to a whole new world. The antagonism, the competition is gone. They can overgrow and colonize and cause uh, colitis and antibiotic-associated diarrhea and all the things we think of with a C. diff infection, and they can be really difficult for us to get rid of. So... Before I go to the summary, I want to go real quick to the Sanford guide that we talked about in the last um, in the last video. Real quick, let's go to anti-infectives again. Let's choose antibacterial agents. 
Then let's choose something different this time. Let's go to our macrolides and let's go with azithromycin. That's z -pac, real common macrolide. If we look along here in our information on azithromycin, we can find a section on antimicrobial spectrum. So you can see what species that it is considered a first-line therapy for. In other words, it's a first option for an Arcanobacter infection, for Bordetella pertussis, which causes whooping cough, Bartonella, Clostridium jejuni, um, uh, Trachomatis trachomatis, that would be uh, Clostridium trachomatis, isn't it? Pretty sure that's Clostridium trachomatis. Um, but you go down the line, Legionella, up to Spira, uh, Mycobacteria genitalium, etc., right? Um, these would be highly recommended, but we also have other options. What's another way to look at it? What if instead of looking at the antibiotic, we go to syndromes and we say, okay, uh, I've got head and neck, I've got uh, otitis media, that's an ear infection, we're going to use acute empiric therapy. Acute means short-term localized, not long-term or chronic. Empiric means based on uh, general evidence and experience as opposed to lab results. Uh, here's our clinical setting, our etiologies, so what can cause it. You can see otitis media can be caused by nothing, um, uh, just irritation of the ear. 70% of the time it's, it's viral, 66% of the time it's viral and bacteria, 92% of the time it can be bacterial. Right? We get all these different combinations when it's bacterial. Um, strep pneumoniae, the pneumococcus, is most common. Haemophilus influenzae would be next. Moraxella catarralis, a close, uh, a close third behind Haemophilus influenzae. We've got our primary regimens for either pediatric or adult, not real common in adult. We've got our alternative regimens. In other words, if we have a reason to not use our primary regimen, right? If our primary regimen, let's say it's a child, is amoxicillin, and the child has a, a severe, uh, maybe a prophyla or a, a anaphylactic response to penicillins, we're going to go to our alternative regimens like ceftonir, cefpidoxime, cefprozil. And you notice the first four all start with ceph, meaning they're cephalosporins. Or then there's our good buddy clindamycin, which is good because it's going to hit the gram negatives and the gram positives, but we just talked about how clindamycin can really wipe out the gut, leave our, our poor little guy susceptible to something like a a yeast infection, or maybe more, more commonly a C. diff infection. Um, more information, lots and lots of information. Let's go back to our drug. Let's say that we wanted to look at um, amoxicillin. We're going to go to our penicillins. We choose our amino penicillins. So you got to know these subcategories. You have to learn them to be able to find your way around. Here's our amoxicillin. We can get more information specifically about amoxicillin, including adjustment dosages, uh, adverse side effects, what it's recommended for, etc., and some of the pharmacology. How, how does it move around in the human body? And then finally, the last one I want to show you is our activity spectra. See, we have a whole category for this. We can go to our antibacterial agents. This is a huge table. But what you see across the very top are the different uh, classes of drugs like penicillins, carbapenems, fluoroquinolones, cephalosporins, etc. You got to learn those, no way around it. And then going down, uh, we have rows of different specific microorganisms. So let's say that, that we're interested in uh, amoxicillin again. So the amoxicillin is right here in our penicillins, if you can find it. I wish I could point to it, there's no way for me to do that. And as we scroll down amoxicillin, you can see um, plus plus in blue for Enterococcus faecalis, but then only a plus minus for Enterococcus faecium. So it's, it's highly recommended for Enterococcus faecalis, but not, not so sure about Enterococcus faecium. And then we get down to Staph aureus, both hospital acquired and community acquired MRSA, and it's not gonna be effective against either of those. Keep going down the line and you can see what it's good against and what it's not good against. And you can see the, mic the microbes on the left are organized based on general description. So we've got our aerobic gram-positive cocci, our aerobic gram-positive bacilli, our aerobic gram-negative bacilli, including enterobacter, um, uh, our aerobic gram-negative bacilli, the non-enterobacteria, and so dividing the, the gut gram-negatives from the non-gut gram-negatives. Um, non-fermenters, cell wall deficient, those ones I mentioned earlier, um, that, uh, that uh, uh, have no peptidoglycan. Uh, then there's the anaerobes that we need to be able to uh, 
determine based on anatomical location of the infection whether we suspect the, the pathogens are going to be anaerobes. So the spectrum of activity is a real important concept for you to recognize because not all drugs are useful against all microbes. All right, so what's our lesson summary? There's no single antibiotic you can use for all bacteria. There's just, you, you just, you can't have just one sitting on the shelf and use it for all occasions. We really do need to be very specific based on uh, what we believe to be the causative agent and, uh, and any contraindications, etc., with your patient history. The narrow spectrum antibiotics are great because they limit the damage to the normal flora. Of course, you, the disadvantage is you have to know what you're up against because if you get it wrong, the infection is going to persist, possibly get worse. <clears throat> Broad spectrum antibiotics are especially useful when you don't know what the microbe is and you're short on time. Right? There's an urgency and you want to get your patient started under treatment. You can start with the broad spectrum drug and possibly send samples to the lab and get an antibiogram to then switch over to something that's a narrower spectrum that isn't going to have all the negative side effects like the potential for uh, a super infection like we talked about earlier when the broad spectrum antibiotics really disrupt the normal microbiome. And then finally broad spectrum antibiotics can lead to super infections like we said. So this was uh, session two or part two of a three-part series, so I really want you to go check out part three now.